John chapter 12, beginning in verse 37. But although he had done so many things before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, even among the, Jew, the rulers, many believed in him. But because of, of the Pharisees, they did, not, or, yeah, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say, or, or what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Let's pray together. Lord, we do pray for Israel. We do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for these hostages. Lord, we pray that you would free every single one of them. Lord, ruin the plans of the enemy in, in that. And I pray that you'd reconcile these people and the soldiers, Lord, with the families and the units and, their, and all that are connected to those lives. Lord, we pray that you would comfort them, strengthen them, give them, use this for your purposes in their lives, give them your perspective. And we pray, Lord, today as we study your word, we, we ask, Lord, that you'd help us to know what you're saying, help us to have ears to hear and be, have hearts that are ready for the word of God to be sown into that would produce an amazing crop. You are so into fruit. And I just pray that you would bear fruit through our lives as a result of these verses. We commit it to you and we recognize, Jesus, you said that your word will never pass away. So thank you, Lord, that we are building our lives upon, you are building our lives upon something that is eternal and will not pass away. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been studying belief for as long as I've been a Christian, 33 years. I, I'm, I've been engaged in evangelism a lot during those years, and I am an evangelist. I haven't been able to walk in that calling fully yet, for sure, but there's ministries coming online uh, I, I soon. You know, that's kind of an ambiguous word, but I'm trying to get everything situated here for, to be ready for people to come in. Um, regarding just organization stuff, children's ministry, new website, follow-up ministries for visitors, and just a bunch of things that need to be in place before we start re reaching out and using all different means for that, whether it be radio or social media, whatever it is. Um, as we're led, God will, will, will use that. Um, but so I've been, I've been focused on what happens when a person hears the gospel, when they are trying to grapple with all of that, and, and then the moment in time when they cross over from death to life. There's a moment in time when we cross over from death to life. We may not know what that moment was, which is totally fine. We're just thankful that it happened. But the fact that people just, when they hear the gospel, how they respond. I've been studying this and I'm fascinated by it. That's one of the reasons why I love testimonies. And that's what is going to be the main piece to our upcoming ministry called The Search. So this is really interesting for me, going through this passage and everything and, and seeing such the emphasis on belief. The word belief or its derivatives are used in our, in our text eight times. And it's all about belief. The whole, John talked about that's the purpose of why he wrote the book, that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, and having believed in him, you will have life through his name. So that's why he wrote that. So, of course, he's going to be talking about these things and emphasizes these things. Again, this is 35 to 40 years after the, 
the, um, the last gospel was written, the Synoptic Gospels. And it's been around 50 years since these events happened. And so he's thinking about, as I've mentioned, what do they need? What would be helpful? Maybe that's not in, so much of what's in the book of John is not in the other gospels. So we, we've learned so much as we've gone through it, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And, and so we've, we've studied, you know, just how God is working through this book and, and he cooperates with that regarding people coming to Christ. That's why it's always good to have people read the, the gospel of John. So we've looked at that. Now, a couple weeks ago when we covered this, when we were in this text before, we covered through verse 36. And I just want to read verse 36 because we're told this. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. So he said, while you have the light, believe in it. And, it's, it, and he knew, of course, that he, at least in the Gospel of John, I mean, how we see these, these things are like he's about to finish his last part of his public ministry. They didn't know in that moment how true that was, to believe in the light while the light is there. They didn't know. The disciples didn't really know, you know, in terms of how they would come to know later, of course. They didn't know that the light was about to be removed. Jesus had, has recently said in our passage just before the passages were coming today that his hour had finally come and that he was going to be glorified. And we, we saw that he told us uh, about a, a, an amazing illustration to understand glorification. And he used the illustration of a, a grain of wheat that goes into the ground and, and it has to die. And, and, for it, and when it dies, it, by God's design, by God's preordainment, then there's a multiplication that happens. Because harvest, the, the, whole, the whole law of, the, of harvest is that you get way more than you sow. And I believe that that, that was to speak about how Jesus would die. Not, in other words, that was in part, God created it that way so that when Jesus came, when they talk about harvesting of souls, talking about you know, being glorified and, and all that, the harvest, the glorification comes through looking at something that has died and something that has bore fruit that multiplies into much, 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 much fruit. So he said, my hour ha has come. And, and, and so he's talking about the fact to them that he's going to go away. And he's going to increasingly do that as we go through the rest of these chapters. He's going to talk about that and prepare them. He's going to start talking about the helper that's going to come. The one he said, like me, is going to come. When it talks about, I'll give you another helper, and we'll get to that in the coming chapters. The word another in Greek means another of the same kind. And he says, he's going to tell them, it's to your advantage that I go away. They would have been content with, it's going to be just as good as it's been. So you know a bomb went off in their hearts, like, what? It's to my, our advantage that you're going away? You know, so we're not any less um, privileged regarding us because we have just as much of the Holy Spirit as the disciples did. And we and, and all of and it have have it to where it's overflowing us. That's possible. As we're refilled with the Spirit, baptized with the Spirit, refilled with the Spirit. Because Jesus told them in John chapter one or excuse me, Acts chapter one, he talks about that 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 you're going to receive power. They had education, spent three year and a half three years with them, three and a half years. They had experience, he'd sent them out but he, they didn't have power. And I believe, my opinion, most of the problems in the church today, besides people not teaching the word and not having a grace-based environment, is there's no power in so many churches. They're powerless because they're not, they haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit or they haven't been refilled with the Spirit, whatever, it mean, whatever they need to have power to be a witness. So, well, you know, I'm sure that's going to come up in it before we even get to the book of Acts. At some point, we'll, we'll go over that. And I believe it'll be in these coming chapters between chapters 14 and 16 when Jesus talks about that the Holy Spirit is with you, but soon he will be in you. And then he, then he promised, in, John, Jesus did in Acts chapter 1, you've already had the with experience. Every, every unbeliever does. He convicts the world of sin. He's in you because in John chapter 20, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Spirit. That's what they were regenerated. And then the pawn came at Acts chapter 2. 
And that, and, and this whole through the rest of the book of Acts, it's upon, it's upon, it's upon for these believers to be to be endued with power to be witnesses to Him, because they were just as scared as we were, we are at times. So He talked about being glorified, and so in a sense, wheat is glorified by the fact that it it bears fruit and multiplies, and but it has to die first. So then He talked about us as believers have to die to self, and He talked about that in those verses that we have to take up our cross, we have to die to self, he who desires to save his life will lose it, he, he who loses his life for my sake, and other gospels say, and the gospel will find it. So we have to die to ourselves as believers in order to bear the kind of fruit that he's looking for, because it doesn't matter what kind of fruit we're looking for, he doesn't even bring in like what bring into the equation how much we want fruit to be produced, he's the one that decides how much fruit is produced through our lives. We don't get to choose that. Because we're supposed to die to ourselves every day, take up our cross, die to self, and then follow him that day. So we don't get to choose how much we mature. We don't get to choose how much fruit we're going to bear if we're talking scripture. We, we, don't, we don't get that luxury to say, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm bearing enough fruit. No, no, no. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. We don't own ourselves. He gets to say that. So that's what a bondservant is, is, is being yielded by, by our will in the sense of wanting to serve him that's accomplished in that way. Jesus said in, in, in um, verse 25, um, in chapter 12 of our verse, um, or what we've already dealt with, he said, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for, etern- keep it for eternal life. So again, dying to self and multiplied fruit needs to happen, but that only happens through the death of us each and every day. We have to settle the lordship issue every single day. Every single day. Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we need to be feeding ourselves on the word of God every single day. And you can't feed yourself with the word of God and not have him compel you by his word or directly by the Holy Spirit that you need to die to self today. You need to make me Lord today and follow me every single day. You know, I'm a a fan of of football. um, And I, 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 I... just watch these interviews of these players and they have all these sayings that they just, they wear them out. And, and I'm the, all the press people are just that cover them all the time are tired of hearing about it, but they say, we just got to take it one day at a time. They, they don't focus on two games from now. Try to ask an NFL player in a press conference. What do you think about this team that you're playing in two weeks? They won't even talk about it. They're focused on right now. They're focused on what's, what's going to happen in this game coming up? I don't know, I have tunnel vision regarding that. Our lives are supposed to be focused one day at a time and focus on what he has for us that day. What are we going to be used in? How is he going to use us? What opportunities is he going to bring my way? Because when you die to self and you take up your cross and you have devotions every single day and you're consistent and all of that, his heart starts to transform your heart with his priorities. We have all these things in our minds that we're supposed to do, but we don't own our life. But we live as if we do. Myself included, I'm talking to me too. So he's trying to get us to surrender. It's the best life you could possibly have because our flesh is all about corruption and all about bad ideas and all about hoarding life's resources on itself. But God hasn't called us to do any of that. Stewardship is, is, is with our lives is just saying, God, take me today. What do you want to use me to do? It doesn't mean that he doesn't give us previous plans days before. I'm not talking, don't get too far with that. But he's, but, it's, but he's free, he's supposed to be free to change things up in our schedule. And, that, and that's what he did with the disciples. It's a reason why he didn't do things the same way all the time. Because he was training them like, I could do anything, at any, any way, because not against scripture, of course, but in terms of how I want to minister, and there's no pattern. You know why he doesn't create this, this pattern of how exactly everything's supposed to be done? Because then we would stop depending upon him to do the work and to bear fruit. We would be, this is how we do it. And that's the danger for us as believers and churches to get immersed in our traditions and we're not flexible and we're, we're totally into just going through the motions. And that's what I believe happened with the church of Sardis that Jesus spoke to and talked about, how, you know, you think you're this, you have a reputation of this, but you're not that. And you need to remember how you received and they've, how they received was dependently and, and trusting God for everything. Just like when you first start serving, you know, you're just scared to death. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And then after a while, you get experience, you start doing it, and you start to see that, that God's been gracious and helpful through the whole t- thing. And then 
after a while, you just stop thinking about him in, in, in your service. And before you know it, you, you, you know, you're not dependent upon him at all. And, and, and you're just going through the motions. That's what God's trying to protect us against. All right, so we're told in verse 36 here that these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. We looked at this before. This is the end of the last verse, the last part of the last verse that we looked at two weeks ago. And I just want to remind us that he didn't hide himself. He was hidden. It's passive. You can see that for Jesus was hidden from them, and I believe by the Holy Spirit there. And so we're going to look at these passages, and John's going to give us a commentary because he, Jesus went out off the scene. And then later when he quotes Jesus, we don't know if that's something that happened just briefly where Jesus just came out of hiding, so to speak, and just said this, or John's remembering back to a previous time. Because again, the, the, Jesus is pretty much done with this, with this public ministry. It doesn't matter which one, though, because it's still instructive and, and relevant for, for us. So we know that after this, starting in John 13, Jesus' focus is going to be on the disciples. There's going to be, we're going to be able to listen in. You ever wish you were a fly on the wall? I, I don't because it, I'd probably get swatted. But, but just to have some kind of microphone and listen in the conversations, we always want to have the inside scoop, right? We want to have the inside info of what's going on. If I could only be paint on the wall, it's always something that, <laughs> why don't you just pretend that you're invisible and you're right there listening? Why do you have to be paint or a, a fly or these are just things I think of, sorry. But uh, anyway, so we're going to see these private conversations happen between Jesus and his disciples. I'm literally looking forward to that. But let's start in our, verse, our text in verse 37, his commentary on belief. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. So they did not believe. So John's commenting on this. And, and um, he had done all these um, unbelievable signs. And they were guilty because they didn't believe because of these signs. He's Just in a few chapters, in chapter 15, verse 24, he's going to say this. If I had not done among them the works which no one did, no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have, they have seen and also hated both me and my father. And I think that's important related to the verses that we're going to look at today. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. But the, the Messiah was was supposed to do miracles. It was all through the Old Testament, that the Messiah, when he came, would do miracles. And also where he was be born, like there's all these things that Jesus fulfilled that they, they weren't paying attention to or didn't know God's word enough or whatever. The, 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 the Pharisees, the religious leaders did know his word. Uh, and, and so they were even more guilty of this. But it also talks about all of this, these miracles that he's going to do. And they should have known better. Jesus did a lot of miracles. And by the way, don't let anyone tell you, I'm not going to, if, if, if Jesus, I would have to see Jesus right here perform a miracle, and then I know I would believe. No, 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 no. Many people didn't believe, and they saw all these miracles. So don't say that. Don't let people say that. Just say, well, that would be interesting because there was many, most people didn't believe, and they saw the miracles. So I don't know how you're different than them. People want excuses. They want to provide those excuses, but... Um, it, it, that definitely deals with that. John tells us this unbelief actually fulfilled prophecy. Look at verse 38. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? So he quotes, John quotes, well, Jesus is quoting, of course, but he records the, the words of Isaiah 53, verse 1, which is an exact quote. It's verbatim, quoting Isaiah. And I want to get into this a little bit because these verses are used other places and there's a reason why Jesus said them and there's a reason why John recorded Jesus saying them. And it's, it's amazing. It's amazing when you see kind of how all this was fulfilled from God's word. So Isaiah 53 is referred to as uh, the chapter about the suffering servant, which is ironic that John placed it right here because he just said his hour is coming, which means he's going to suffer. That's his hour, means a suffering for the sin of mankind. But also we're right before chapter 13 where Jesus is going to reveal how much of a servant he is as an example so that we would serve one another. So it's ironic he's quoting uh, this verse right here. And um, 
but he, he, he's telling them just kind of why this is such a fulfillment. Because Isaiah starts the chapter about the Messiah, this whole chapter, Isaiah 53, or yeah, Isaiah 53, that, that he's talking about the suffering of Jesus. And so this the chapter, chapter 53, begins, says, who has believed our report, which means a testimony. Who will believe, who believes our testimony? That's what it means. And, and it's interesting because Isaiah's, I believe, talking about when he says, who will believe our, who's the our? It's Isaiah and the other prophets and people that God has raised up to speak about, about the, these, these judgments that are coming to Judah and the southern kingdom. Because that's who Isaiah was mainly ministering to, is speaking to Judah, who was in rebellion to God, and talking about that God was going to judge them. And, and, and of course, God knew they were gonna, that Nebuchadnezzar would come and have three campaigns, culminating to the last one in 586, where he'd take the, them back to Babylon and everything. So he's, he's, it's interesting how all of this is, is laid out. And he also says, um, and to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed. So again, he talks about who has believed and to whom has it been revealed. Who, is, who are those people? It's many people, as we're going to see. But it's at least the people that Jesus is quoting this about regarding seeing all these miracles and still not believing the, the gospel, not believing that he's the Messiah, all of that. What's arm of the Lord mean? It means strength. It means power. So your right arm, most people are right-handed. I'm not. I'm the only one in my left mind. But, but most people are right-handed. And so we, talk, we see scripture where it talks about the strong arm of the Lord. And it talks about his power. So these miracles were a demonstration of God's power. Only, only God has the power to do those kind of things that Jesus did, and later he would call his disciples to do. But, but it, was, it was dispatched authority from him to them to, to walk in these miracles. So it, it means, it means this, there's been powerful miracles that have been done, and, and they should have believed, but they didn't. And, but he also used the word revealed. Who has the arm of the Lord been Reveal. So this whole thing regarding what Jesus in the middle of and his ministry and this pa- his power, his miracles, all those things was an expression of his power and they were revealed to a very specific people. They witnessed it, but yet they did not believe. So, so he says his miraculous arm and of power has been revealed, it's been on full display for everybody to see. You know, John later in John 21 verse 25 is going to say many other things Jesus did and if written one by one, the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So, so we're talking not just miracles that John has been led by the Spirit to reveal to us, or even the miracles that, you know, that, that, he, that it's revealed in the other Gospels and everything. The, that's the amount of miracles that were done, and they still did not believe. They did not believe, and God knew that they, they wouldn't. He, you know, he told well, we'll get into that. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just excited. This is amazing here, them, this whole passage. So Isaiah was led to record what he wrote, but this scene is not the only one that fulfills these scriptures. The Apostle Paul, speaking of Israel, also applies this verse to unbelieving Jews in his day when he wrote Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 17, which I'll read now. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they be, believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who, uh, who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So Paul uses this, he says, it's fulfilling right at that day, you know, which was decades after the events of, of, of the Lord Jesus' ministry and his suffering and all of that. So um, we need to bring the gospel to them. They can't believe the report unless we bring, bring them the truth of what's going on there. And, and so it requires us to go. That's what the whole Great Commission is about. Uh, and, and, and so, but John uses it differently. And he, look at, look with me at verse 39. He adds, therefore they could not believe because Isaiah said again, and we'll pause there for a second. They said, I just have to stop and say like, look at it, it says right there in verse 39, they could not believe. 
So they, they did not believe, and then eventually they could, they could not believe. There's a progression that happens. We choose not to believe, and then it becomes we can't believe. And that's, a, that's he's giving a biblical basis for all of that. And I'll get into what that means in a second. But um, in verse 40, we're told, we qu- actually quotes the, the verses here from the Old Testament in Isaiah 6. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. So this is from Isaiah chapter 6. And you remember the account where Isaiah is, he sees the Lord high and lifted up. And he sees that the train of his robe filled the temple. He sees angels there that were beautiful. The place shook, you know, and, and you know, he, he's like, hearing the angels cry out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the place was filled with smoke. And then he says, he reacts, woe is me. You know, when you, when you, the closer you are to God, the more sinful that you see you are. That's why the holier you are, the longer you walk with the Lord and the holier you are, the more aware of the sin in your life. You actually repent more. Because you're closer to him, and the closer we get to him, the more we see how much... In other words, it's like when you get to us the standard of something, the closer you get to the standard by which everything is judged, it, it reveals to you even more how much the standard or the, the, that which is being compared to the standard doesn't, doesn't line up to that standard because you get a better view of the standard. So he's dealing with all this, and he, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So he's, he's being so convicted. And by the way, they, the Jews will try to say that the suffering servant is Israel. But Israel, he says right here, is, Israel's not perfect. Israel's unclean lips. So, and sometimes people say Isaiah is the suffering servant, what he went through, because he was persecuted and he was eventually, a tradition says he was sawed in two. That's referred to in, 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 without quoting his name in Hebrews 11. But, you know, it's, it's a matter of, you know, seeing God and seeing his pureness and his holiness and having that, that honest, real reaction. I do want you to see this last part of the verse in a, in that I just read where it says, eyes, uh, my eyes have seen the king. Very important. Just tuck that away for a moment. So after his sin was purged, they t- the angel took hot coal to his lips and, and he was purged of his sins. And then Isaiah heard the Lord say, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. So what did God tell him once he surrendered? And there should be a lot of more of us saying this. Here I am, send me. And not focusing on what everyone else is doing or not doing, but like being willing and open to to go wherever God calls us to go and be surrendered to him. That's a healthy reaction to being person of our sin and, and being forgiven of all things we've been forgiven just to say, here I am, send me. Where is it that you want to send me? And, and, and so much of what God does is sending people to preach the gospel. So this is what he said in in, in verse nine of that passage. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and and return to be healed. So this, so Isaiah is going to be called to preach mainly to the southern kingdom, they're not going to listen. They've already hardened their hearts. And so God is going to set their heart like he did with Pharaoh. Pharaoh already had a hard heart, and he had even more of a hard heart as time went on, as these judgments happened. But then there's a different Hebrew word that means to confirm, to set, to make stiff. And that's what God did. But it wasn't that he was a puppet and couldn't do anything and it was predetermined. God knows the future, of course. He knows how he's going to work. He knows people's hearts. And there was, it wasn't like he didn't have a choice because later Pharaoh repents. Pharaoh says, I have sinned. And he, and he takes responsibility. So it, he himself knew he was responsible for that. And it wasn't God just treating him like a puppet or whatever. So the point is the children of, of Israel in Judah had already hardened their hearts. 
And they are because that's why they're in the condition that they were of rebellion to God. And so he's sending uh, Isaiah to prophesy to them and basically is in a sense pronouncing judgment on them. And, and so that's the context um, here regarding why, why Jesus is quoting this, I believe. And there are passages where in the Gospels where it quotes this verse where it says it's fulfilling that too, when he told parables and they didn't understand. You know, and, and so what parables do is yeah, all teachings of, of the Lord, but especially terribles, par- terribles. That's if you can't interpret them correctly. They're terribles. Because <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. Now, there's been people that have said a pastor shouldn't teach parables unless they've been in the ministry for 30 years because they can mess them up. But there's one main point. When you, when you study parables, just look for the one main point. There's not a whole massive amount of different points in the in a parable. It's one main point. So that's just, you know, extra information. But uh, so these verses not only explain to Isaiah that his words would be a form of judgment because it would confirm Judah in their unbelief, but also be prophetic in revealing what would happen a little over 780 years later in the ministry of the promised Messiah. So that's the, the connection. And notice Isaiah saw when he when he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Notice that he says that it was Jesus in verse 41. John says it was Jesus Isaiah was looking at. Look at verse 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. The context is Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. And so uh, that's amazing. You can miss that on the surface if you're not looking at it in depth in the sense of context. You can miss that. And, and, And so follow this with me. You have the Lord Jesus they're high and lifted up. He commissions Isaiah and he's telling him, you're going to go to this people. They're not going to listen. I'm going to confirm them in their unbelief. And then 780 years later, 783 years later, whenever it was, when, when he was the one that Isaiah saw was on earth and preaching that gospel, he was going to use that prophecy. I mean, he was going to use the prophecy through speaking it to these people, to, and it would be fulfilled. That, that they, because they'd seen all these miracles. They had seen so much, way more than we will ever see, in, unless God shows us a video or, well, I hope he does that. But so, so he's there, and he's, he's proclaiming this, and that explains why they didn't understand the parables, because the parable, that's what I was getting to, the parable. So when, you, when, you, when he speaks a parable, your understanding of it reveals your heart. If you have a heart that doesn't want truth and you've rejected the Lord and, and already and you're, you're getting hardened in that, in that position, it's going to be confusion to you. By the, fact, by the time Jesus was speaking these parables, a lot of them had already rejected him. And, and so he's saying that basically this reveal, reveals your heart. And, and of course, the disciples said they didn't understand a lot of the parables. You know, so he's saying it's, it's been given to you the meaning. But these people, not for, they haven't been given the meeting. And so because of their hearts, then these things actually make things not clearer, but, but foggier or more hidden because it's a sign of the fact that they've already rejected and they've all, they don't want truth at any cost. And, and so that, that, that's, that's how it all works together. That's how it, that, those verses are used in other places in Scripture and all of that. So he, he, he's... he's uh, you know, the Lord Jesus lifted up. And, but, but notice every, everyone didn't reject. There are some that believe. Look at verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. So they believed secretly. You know, that some of the leaders and the Pharisees were in this category and they followed secretly they didn't but they didn't want to be these people are rejecting they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue we don't understand that but being put out of the synagogue means a lot you lose your business contacts you know you there's a lot that was done in that through those relationships and you're put out of the synagogue you were considered cursed and they wouldn't want anything to do with you so you lose everything basically but the main thing where it's revealed here that they would lose is the approval of man for they love the praise of men more than the praise of of God, and that's boy, you could just do a whole ser- ser- sermon series on that. How the approval of man can get in the way of God's calling on our lives and being obedient to the Great Commission, caring more about the praise of man instead of the praise of God. 
at the old saying is better be a fool in the eyes of man than a fool in the eyes of God. So they were they were afraid, and 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 so that 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 prevented them from be, having it be made public, having everybody see that they were followers of Jesus. They weren't willing to do that. So it says in Proverbs, the fear of man is a snare. You know, Jesus at one point says, beware when all men speak well of you. That's why we face tribulation. He promised that. It's a promise we don't like to claim. You know, we don't have it in the little promise book, a prom- list of prover- promises on our kitchen table. They used to have these little cards that they promises of God. They never had, in this life, you will face tribulation, <laughs> be of good cheer. We don't want that. But the point is, because we're called to speak out, because we're called to be vocal and be bold and to preach the gospel, like Paul said, without a preacher, how can they believe? Well, I like to just be a silent witness with my life. We just read faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's talking about the gospel. The first, the first meaning of that is talking about the gospel not all the rest of God's word, as much as that does produce faith. So we have to preach that gospel. We have to be um, bold in that and not worry what people think. If they're speaking, if all men are speaking well of me, there's a problem because the world is evil and has fallen and going the wrong direction. So we, if you're looking for everyone to like you in this world and you're going to try to be a disciple, it's not going to work out well. And it's going to get worse and worse as we get closer to the end. There's going to be more persecution, more costs, It'll weed out a lot of people that are, uh, you know, not true believers. They're make believers, you know. They go through the motions and everything. But when it comes to persecution, they fall away. Jesus talked about that in the parable of the soils. He talked about persecution, and they and they fall away as a result of that. So now we're going to see in this last section that Jesus cries out. Well, I don't know when this was. He could have come out with being from being hidden for just this one last thing, or it could have happened earlier. But Jesus or John rather, wants to say this before he ends Jesus' public ministry. It doesn't matter. The point is, the, the content is what we need. So we'll start there, verse 44. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. So all these things he's already said before. When you, you, it's, They're a package deal. That's why I think it's possible, when, when the reason why Jesus said this, and then John saying that, I mean, he, Jesus saying it was fulfilled, and then John recording it, because because in the in the in that application of these verses, who has believed our report? Who's the hour? It could be the Father and the Son. Who has believed the Father and the Son's testimony about Jesus? Who has believed? Because that's the what's going on right now with these verses. That's how they're being fulfilled right now. They're not believing Jesus' report. And and Jesus' report is the Father's report. He doesn't say anything or do anything that the Father doesn't first reveal to him to say. And that's how we're called to be not to say anything or do anything apart from what God's led us to to do. So he says here when uh, that who believes me is believing the Father. And then he says in verse 45, and he who sees me sees him who sent me. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, haven't I been with you so long? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he says in verse 46, I have come as a light into the world and whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. So that's not what's supposed to mark our lives. What's supposed to mark our lives is walking in the light and and being in the light as he is in the light. Then we have fellowship with one another. But also all these things need to be, that's why I believe that the rapture is going to be the catalyst for releasing the Antichrist into the world. Because it says in Thessalonians that he who restrains will be taken out of the way. And I believe that's talking about the, the spirit inside of us. Yeah, the Holy Spirit's omnipresent, of course, but there's a ministry that he accomplishes through us that will be removed when we're caught up and then all, all, everything will be, you know, starting in terms of the, the tribulation. And then he says, verse 47, and if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So his mission when he came to earth was not to be a judge. We've seen that. He didn't come to judge at that moment, but he's going to judge later. The great white throne judgment. But he says it's not primarily him that's going to be doing the judging. It's going to be his word. And he says in verse 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day because he's preached to them the gospel and the kingdom of God. And when it says in the great white throne judgment in Revelation, it says all those whose names were not written in the book of life 
were cast into the lake of fire. So that's what, I mean, there are other books that are open, we're told, but the main thing that's stressed in scripture is the book of life. If your name's not in the book of life, that's what's going to judge you. And how do you get in the book of life? By believing what Jesus said, believing the gospel. And, and so he says, I didn't come to judge. That what's going to judge you is my words in the end. But my mission is to die for the world, not to judge the world at this moment. Verse 49, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say what I should say and what I should speak. Verse 50, and I know that this command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, I speak. So this command is everlasting life. He's saying, because Paul, I just read the verses, said those who don't obey the gospel. Believing is obeying what he calls us to do. He just, we just saw two weeks ago, he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. He's working by the Holy Spirit to, to convict them of sin and of righteousness and all these things. And if they, he, also the Holy Spirit's saying, Jesus is the right choice. Trust in Jesus. That's what he's saying all the time. And, and those people, you know, are hearing that by him or through people, but they have to um, appropriate that. And if they don't, they're going to be held accountable. So he says, I speak whatever my father has told me to speak. And that kind of finishes his public ministry, at least in John. We're right at, just before the, the night of, of his betrayal. And we'll get into that next week, Lord willing. I want just to give you a couple of, of applications. So first of all, if you're here and you haven't received Christ, you're in danger every time that you hear the gospel, which you will after, at the end of the service, and you don't respond. It hardens your heart. It changes in you. So if you're here you've, and you know that you haven't been born again, you haven't received Christ, you haven't trusted in Christ, don't leave here without making that decision. Because at some point, we don't know when that is as believers, for other people for sure, but there's a point at which he confirms us in our unbelief and we can't believe. And, and I don't believe that's an easy thing to do. I don't think it's a, I think it's a, you know, Remember, this is a result, him applying this, these verses as a result of them seeing all his miracles. So to that amount, a level of, of proof, and you harden your heart, for sure you're, you know, that's going to happen. But for us, we don't have that same amount. Unbelievers don't have that same amount of accountability in terms of what's manifest to them. So there's a process. So, but we have, we're in da- you're in danger of that. If you're listening to this voice on YouTube or after the fact, don't harden your heart against the gospel. And please message us or contact me, and I would love to lead you in a prayer to trust in Christ. So we as believers who are sharing our faith, and we have family members that have been rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, we can't make that assumption that they passed that line and now they can't believe. We can never know that because we can never know their heart. But they can. They can know how, many, how in danger they are to that. God could show him, and he has shown him. Many times you hear people talk about how God told me, like, it's getting close, like, I have to choose now, you know, or it's too late. And and so that's going to happen. But again, as believers, we can't know that. So we're called to just be faithful, to preach the gospel, preach the gospel, love people, just never give up all the way to their dying breath. And then, of course, we can't pray for them after they die, because it's pointed once a man to have experienced judgment, and then after that, then they, they have to deal with the consequences of that judgment. So it's appointed once for man to die, then comes the judgment. There's no, there's no space after that for them to repent. So we need to understand that. People are in that process, and, and we need to be patient with that. And, and we need to just keep being faithful, keep being faithful, keep progr- uh, promoting the gospel and sharing the gospel. And we also, lastly, we can't be surprised by rejection. It can't stumble us. We can't just give up praying for people. We can't give up reaching people. You know, they can say whatever they want. The more angry they get, the more hostile they get, they get, I believe they're closer to the kingdom of God than someone that's indifferent. Because they're kicking against the goads. Paul heard that from Jesus. Why are you kicking against the goads? His whole resistance to the gospel, hearing Stephen in the synagogue, you know, seeing Stephen prophesy and speak all the things that he did when he was holding the jacket, so to speak, of the people that were stoning and hearing him say, look, you know, it's the only time we see in the Bible where Jesus stood in heaven. He said, look, Jesus is standing. 
you know, and God was honoring them. He was with, Jesus was with him as he was dying, but Paul saw all that. And that's how he dealt with it, is just going against it even harder. He's kicking against, what's a goat? A goat is the things that keep the cattle from hurting themselves. And they, they, they would, they, when they kick against it, it motivates them to not do that anymore and to be cooperative. He is fighting against that. He's fighting against that, and people can be fighting against that. Don't take the bait. Don't be swayed. Just stick right in there with, the, with, with praying for them and sharing with them and being an example, all those things. Don't give up. But there is a time where they could reach that point of no return, where God just honors their choice that they've made after all the things that they've seen, incontributable proof to them by his spirit that God says, I confirm you in this and you can't believe. That's a scary thing to think about. It should bring not any anxiety for us, those that know the Lord, but in terms of how we, the, the urgency with which we need to try to reach people and, and to be faithful to, to preach that gospel because faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith comes by hearing the gospel. When they hear the gospel, that's when the Holy Spirit gets behind all of that and that's when, when, when God produces faith in them to, to trust in, in um in the Lord. So let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this passage. Thank you for the beauty of it. Lord, we see the somber warning of it. Lord, I pray that you would use that in our lives as you see fit. I have no idea, Father, how you're going to use that in our lives, but I trust that you will. And I just thank you for your word. I thank you that you're, you are very gracious with people and you do give them so many chances after chance after chance to believe, Lord. But we we acknowledge that you you at some point will harden people's heart in the sense of confirming what they've already expressed in their unbelief. Jesus, you said that men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil and they don't want to come into the light lest their deeds be exposed. We know the true motive of, of unbelief. So help us to, to not take any of these smoke screens and these things that get us off topic and these endless meaningless debates that mean nothing but get to the truth of the matter with the gospel, which is the power of you unto salvation for those who believe. Help us to be so faithful to produce that and stay with that message because we know that's where the power is. Help us to not get distracted with all these debates and things. Help us to stay true and focused on your gospel. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.